including a pretty good storm last night. It's had a bigger impact than I thought. I didn't realize it had such an impact on the hotel till I stepped out of my elevator this morning into ankle deep water. Uh, the lobby of the Diamond Head was awash, as it were. But they had an army of people and there was squeegees <laughs> pushing it out and it was running right back in about as fast. So anyway, and they said, by the way, there's uh, one of the elevators isn't working. And I thought, well, my first thought was, is anybody caught in the elevator? And, and uh, the, <laughs> the hotel people went, well, we don't know. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I thought, shouldn't somebody check, maybe? <laughs> Take a look. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Bryan. I'm your facilitator for this week's um, training and learning. And uh, I think you'll find uh, the leadership forum is uh, pretty much unlike anything you've ever experienced in your leadership uh, training up to this point. Uh, I think the military folks here and those who have served in the military will find this familiar terrain. Uh, most of what we talk about here from the very first presenter at 9.30 uh, will sound very familiar to you. Why? Because here we uh, uh, explore the concept of leadership from the perspective of servant leadership. Uh, the idea that Mission first, people always, isn't just a cliched statement in the military. It really serves us well, we have found, throughout all organizations. <clears throat> One of the reasons the Leadership Forum was created about 12 years ago was, was to answer a problem, though, uh, answer the call, to try to raise up a generation of business leaders who would, in fact, understand that there's a lot more to leadership than sitting behind your desk watching your spreadsheet. That there's a difference in management and leadership. That in fact, people are your most important resource, et cetera, et cetera. This is all gonna be made clear to you. This is, these three days, by the way, are gonna go by very fast. Uh, it may sound like it doesn't because we're, we're off to a slow start this morning, but uh, in fact, it goes very fast. There are six sessions over three days one in the morning, one in the afternoon. There's lots of free time. I'll cover all of that with you here uh, shortly. But the first thing we want to do is to give some important people a chance to say uh, welcome to you. We're expecting our Google Cloud sponsor, Scott Froman, to be. Oh, hey, Scott. I'm sorry. How could I miss that shirt? Please, come on up, Scott. And... and uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Google Cloud as our sponsor for the uh, Leadership Forum. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Scott Froman. Thanks. Well, you know, Google feels very lucky to, uh, to be that sponsor. Uh, I'm honored on behalf of the division of Google that I work in for Google Cloud to be able to sponsor such an important initiative as Leadership Forum. So, has anybody, has anybody here heard of Google, the company? <laughs> <laughs>
it's it's very different from how stereotypically we think of the military. You know, the commanders that are served for people, the commanders that are to help uh, you know, put put people on the front lines and meet need. And we actually have a system at Google that that measures leadership on that dimension. So there's a, there's a surprising amount of of similarity mm -hmm. between the topics that we're going to cover in these three days and how we think about you know, leadership. Thanks for letting me have a few minutes with your folks. I look forward to seeing you all at the graduation. Yeah, great. Thanks. Scott Roman, thank you so much. I can tell you their sponsorship here makes it possible for all of our government people to attend uh, uh, essentially free. Uh, that's what they do. And by the way, uh, it's also worth mentioning that every, everyone you see in here, and you'll get to meet our team here in just a second, Every, everybody here is a volunteer, including me. Uh, all the proceeds, everything that goes into this, all go to the education fund of the AFSIA Hawaii Education Foundation. And here to speak to that and welcome you as the president of the Hawaii uh, Education Foundation is Linda, come on up. to be where I was between the operators on the military side, the technical community that works within the government and industry partners, and the leadership, and I found myself translating a lot, just to try to figure out what the military needed, what the technical community could do. I grew up in the budget world, I figured out how to get money so they could get that stuff, and then I turned to the operators and said, here's the stuff, you got to figure out strongly about leadership and about people and about mentoring. So this is a unique opportunity that you have here. There'll be a few more people coming in. You'll have some incredible presenters that have great careers. A number of them have been prior duty, or prior active duty. So some of them were senior folks. They went on to business careers, or some of them are never worked for the military.
information was able to give out with the Hawaii chapter, $92,000 for 26 scholarships. Over the last four years, we've given 105 scholarships for $250,000. And since 1997, the chapter and the Educational Foundation has given about $2 million in scholarships, grants, science fair awards, and other specific donations to other nonprofit organizations here in Hawaii. So part of it is when you guys are here learning, we're able to have support from industry partners as well as hold this during TechNet, which, which helps our chapter and helps the Educational Foundation and the Health Center. So thank you and good luck. Thanks, Linda. So uh, he will pick his moment when he uh, decides to pop in, but I'm expecting a former commander of the uh, U.S. Pacific Command, Admiral Dick Mackey, will be here. Uh, but I never know when he's going to show up. Uh, I also expect that uh, Admiral Nancy Norton will pop in to see us at some point in time. She's the current director of the Defense Information Systems Agency. So from time to time, we'll have people pop in, and we'll give them a chance to uh, say a few words to you to welcome you uh, to this uh, thing that we call the Leadership Forum. I want to take a moment here before I get into uh, some of the content material, how we're going to proceed and introduce the team uh, that's here supporting you. First of all, uh, Sean, uh, in the back back there, you've all heard from Sean. You've got an email from Sean. She's our chief communicator. And believe me, what I do is easy compared to what she does. You know, she pulls all the pieces together to make this possible. And her assistant is Dave Koger. Uh, and with us, I believe Chris, uh, Chris makes all the electrons flow back there. And this is. Uh, Chris and I have done this. So I think this is our fifth year together in here, right, Chris? Uh, and so uh, that's, uh, that's the small team that, that pulls all of this together uh, for you. And so um, I hope that, and I'm confident, really. Uh, we've done this now seven years here at this conference, the FCA. Uh, uh, it was called TechNet Asia Pacific, and now it's called TechNet Indo-Pacific. Uh, that was a change this year, wasn't it? The command changed its name? Well, yeah, so it's now the Commander Indo-Pacific Command. Yeah, so, uh, you know, nothing's more uh, steady than the rate of change, right? I mean, just when you think everything is uh, never going to change, and then it does. So uh, let me now uh, bring up Sean. She's going to cover some ad admin items for you. Come on in, Amy. Uh, find a seat in the back back there. Chris? Yes, this is uh, Amy Tabita. Amy's our first, your first speaker this morning. So, uh, so Sean's going to come up and cover some administrative things uh, for you. Uh, I tell you, uh, one, and I'll mention this a couple of times because um, we actually uh, treat you uh, as adults in here. Uh, we actually use the, uh, and behave. this course, uh, this training, is based on the concepts of andragogy. Anybody ever heard that term before? That is a term which is used to describe adult learners as opposed to child learners. When you were in school and you had a teacher said, uh, Aram, you don't have an idea. I'm just going to tell you what you need to know, and then I'm going to test you and have you feedback. I mean, that's how we were all schooled, right? That's called pedagogy, and uh, where the teacher is the font of knowledge. Well, in the leadership forum, every one of you is considered, I mean, you're all grown-ups, and you've got a whole basis of experience. Uh, when uh, David Friedrich, when he walked in this morning, I was uh, stunned. He and I were... Uh, generals together in the army. <laughs> here he, he's in here. He'll he'll be a, uh, someone you'll want to get to know. He's a uh, he's a great Green Beret general. Uh, but this is a, a course uh, by adults for adults. And when I say that, uh, as 
John's going to cover a number of things here. We don't have breaks scheduled. Uh, we don't have, um, you know, we ask you to turn your phones off and she'll cover all of that and everything. But, but you know what? If you need to go to the bathroom, get up and go to the bathroom. If you need to go get a cup of coffee, it's right outside, go get yourself a cup of coffee. Um, we just don't pick up scheduled time for that sort of thing, you know. Uh, and so hopefully we'll get some more of the class in here. We're now up to about a third of what we're expecting. This is supposed, should be, at some point in time, a full house. And hopefully they'll find their way here during the day. But first, let me introduce you to Sean McKee, who's going to cover some important admin information. Hi, good morning. Uh, first off, uh, registrations, because I know I sent the last email out a little late yesterday. Um, if you haven't registered, and I'll say it again for the people who've come, um, on our breaks or in between sessions, we'll make sure you get out to get your, um, your badge. The important piece for the badge, um, as I said in the email, is security. I know quite a few people came up through these back elevators. Um, but security is on the floor, supposed to be back here by the elevators. If they see you without a badge, they will ask you to leave. I'll leave the floor. In addition to that, your badges will come with four meal tickets, uh, three lunches for today, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then a, uh, I said three, it should be. Lunches for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and breakfast for Wednesday as well. Uh, if you do not get those four tickets, uh, let me know when you come back, and then I'll go take care of those as well. Uh, bathrooms, General just covered. Uh, the bathrooms, uh, as far as locations for the restrooms, when you come out the door of this room, make a left. You'll see elevators to your left-hand side. Just go past those elevators, make another quick left, and then make a third left into the bathrooms just before you enter the hallway for the exhibit area. Uh, if you get into the exhibit area or the hallway where you see other vendors and you've gone too far, just come back and at that point make a quick right. Uh, as he spoke to as well, oops. That's me. Oh, you're sorry. Everybody awake now? Okay. Also, as he mentioned earlier, there is coffee uh, just outside this back door. There's water um, inside the classroom as well. And then if you have Ms. Joy, one of our wonderful supporters, Ms. Joy Hess from Weight Light provided some um, Hawaii cookie company snackage as well. So please feel free to step back and get um, a few of those. Uh, the exhibit floor, uh, again, pretty full schedule, but as time permits, please feel free to go out and walk the exhibit floor. Please make a special trip up to the STEM floor on the second level to support our high school students with different robotics and other teams in, um, in the STEM room. And each day there's a different team. Is that right? Yeah, they have uh, different teams every morning and afternoon. So we've got four, four rotating uh, sets of Cyber Patriot teams and robotics teams, uh, each of this today and tomorrow. In addition to the exhibit floor, there will be opportunities for networking. So please take full advantage of that while you're here as well. Um, be it doing the keynote speak speeches or walking back over, just talking to different people. I saw people doing it earlier here in the classroom. So please take full advantage um, of the opportunity to do some networking. Parking is probably big for everyone. Um, I will collect <laughs> everyone's parking ticket and get them validated and get them back to you before the end of class. So just as you have a moment, uh, you can bring it to me back at the table, um, or just before we head over for the lunch, we can, you can hand me the tickets and I'll get everything validated. Uh, speaking of lunches and back to the meals, uh, at each keynote address, there will be t three tables reserved for the leadership forum. If you could find those tables, this on your ticket, it will say sit in any, what was it? Unnumbered. Yeah, yeah, so disregard the unnumbered please, piece please look for the leadership forum tables. And again, there'll be three, so there'll be plenty of room for all of us to, um, to sit, sit as a group. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had something. Texting and emails, again, so that everybody is an adult. If you need to take a call or you need something else that's going on, because life still happens, if you could just step outside the room to take care of those and then come back in. And again, this back door will have the door stop, so 
um, you can come in and out without disrupting the rest of the class. Um, AFSIA app. Um, has anybody downloaded the AFSIA app? So it's AFSIA 365. So on your Android or iPhone, look for that app and that'll have the schedule for the entire conference, the different exhibitors, and it's full of information on there. All right, new this year is our Bring Your Own Device or BYOD. So definitely looking for feedback on any issues you have, ways that we can improve that, and any other information that you have as we try to move um, to a more electronic form as well. This year we have a blended format. So again, let us know what you like and don't like about that. So welcome all feedback um, on that. Um, next year I'll be back helping out with the form. So we'll take all of your comments, constructive criticism and everything to make um, improvements for next year. Um, speaking of the electronic format, hey Chris, can you bring up the Google Drive? If you have not had an opportunity opportunity to access the drive yet, hey Chris, can you go back out to students? Back it out to students. So in your emails, in the email I sent, the welcome email and a follow up one, there should have been an email invite to join the um, the Google Drive for specifically for the leadership forum. Um, it should say students. And this is when you open it up. These are the folders you will see. Um, inside of the course content folder, you will find, you don't have to pick this one, Chris, but um, in the student guide folder is a PDF form of the entire student guide to include all of the bios, the um, exercises that you're going to be doing, all in a PDF form. So if you want to follow through the course that way, in addition to A, or will be doing a PowerPoint brief, you'll have that brief inside of the session folder. In addition to it, you will have the reading specifically for that session as well. And then there are two other forms inside of the folder. One is, for, well, they're both for your small group exercises. One is a um, Google Forms. So if you complete that, it'll automatically feed the information um, back to me so I can capture that. If you're more comfortable just doing it say, in a Word format, you also have the option to open up the Google Docs um, form as well to read it. In addition to that, we also provided a hard copy of all the exercises, the small group exercises in your binders. So if you're more comfortable handwriting as opposed to electronic, or you didn't bring your like electronic device, you also have that piece of paper in your binders as well. Um, the only or will make mandatory to complete electronically will be your personal leadership philosophies. And again, you have two options to do those. You can either complete it on the website, or again, if you're more comfortable doing it hard copy, once you complete those, if you can get it to me to scan in prior to you leaving, then I'll scan that in as well. Um, I think that is it. Any questions for the website or accessing the Google Drive? All right, great. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Sean. You're welcome. So, uh, let me uh, just take a few minutes to talk about a couple of things that I think will be important. Uh, we're, uh, what we're after here is to, in the next three days, and by the way, uh, this three days of training, um, one of the reasons that so few people have the benefit of training like this is that these kinds of things usually are like two weeks long. And people who matter in organizations, it's difficult for them to take off and leave their job for two weeks. Uh, I think you'll find that, that our format here is three days, but it requires that you invest yourself in the process. 
And so you'll have plenty of opportunity to do that this morning. Uh, you're going to have uh, guest speakers. Each session is two hours long. First hour, you'll have a guest speaker who is a senior leader, very experienced individual, who will cover uh, their material with you. I, I challenge you and I ask you to engage with them. Uh, they want you to engage with them. And they'll try to draw you in if you're like sitting back. They'll pull you in. Uh, because the more you invest in this, the more you're going to get out of it. Now, Sean mentioned that there is an outcome here. Uh, I, I have learned, and we have learned in the leadership forum, that in order for leadership to really have the kind of gravity and traction that produces exceptionalism, we're not trying to make you a good leader here. We're trying to draw out, help you discover the exceptional leader that's already inside you. And we're going to try to do that. But we're also going to actually ask you, there is a writing requirement, and it's called your personal leadership philosophy. Now, your literature, as Sean was describing it, has, and when we get to that, you'll find examples that other students have written. You'll find mine uh, in there as well. We also give you an outline of, if, if you're trying to think, gosh, what do I put in this thing? There's even an outline. And the reason I'm telling you this right up front is start taking notes and thinking uh, uh, about this right now. Because not only are we going to ask you to write it down, it's not a, by the way, it's not a big deal. You'll be, your problem will be, how do I do this in one page? It won't be trying to think of what to say. Trust me, you're going to be filled with information. And it's going to, the challenge will be, how do I do this in a page? Mine's two pages. But I would say, don't exceed two pages. One and a half is the student, if you will, average. One page is perfect. It's personalized. The outline we provide you is simply an aid. It is not a required format. This is something that is personal to you. <coughs> You're going to say, this is what I believe. This is how I will behave as a leader. And you're going to sign it. And guess what? Then we're going to encourage you to go back and give it to the people you supervise. If you're their boss, they deserve to see this and know, know you to that level. Uh, the advantages and the reason why this is important will be so clear to you uh, Thursday afternoon um, that I, I won't even try to cover it with you right now. But trust me, it will have an impact. And guess what? We've had students go back and give it to their boss. And it changed their bosses. Because it caused their bosses to have to think critically about their own leadership style. And you'll find that when the word gets out that this is taking place, you'll have your peers come to you and say, what are you, what are you handing out to your people? And why is the boss, why is our boss now asking me for my personal leadership philosophy? What, what is that? So you're going to be in a position to influence your peers as well. It's an amazing process. But if it's not written down and it's not handed out, if it's not truly a statement by you of what you believe about leadership and how you intend to behave because of those beliefs as a leader, and you don't write it down, then, it, then believe me, it, it disappears in the ether. The pressures of the world close in around you so fast. So that's why we do that. Um, and in the last hour of the Thursday afternoon, you'll have a chance to share that with other people uh, here in the, in the class. Okay? Now, let me cover a couple of other things with you real quick. Uh, and then we're going to get on to our first speaker. In your student guide, you have a welcome letter. Have you had a chance to read that? Yes, no? I'm looking for heads this way or that way. <laughs> Prob I'm looking for feedback here. I can't, Becky, I can't see you because you're sitting right in front of that bright curtain. 
So is your head going up and down? Oh, okay, good. All right. And then um, if you read the welcome letter, you'll see it start giving you a lot of clues as to how we operate in here and why what we do in here is a little different. Why it can be done in three days and what's required of you. But I also wanted to mention to you, right behind the welcome letter, I want to share this little story with you real quick. And what you'll find about me in here is in the time that we're here together, I'm going to tell dozens of stories. That's, that's the way I try to make my points, is by telling stories from my own experience. Well, this little girl was given a challenge by her third grade teacher. Uh, God bless. And, and they were all trying to, you know, she's trying to teach her students how to write something uh, critically important. And so the question was, what's one of your strengths? Well, with no coaching from me, she wrote that, what you see in the student guide there. I'm a really good leader. And why is she a really good leader? Because she can solve problems. And how does she solve problems? She listens. And she's just like that. She's my granddaughter. I keep trying to figure out a way to get her out of school and bring her here. So I can then say, and here she is. <laughs> she's, uh, I see it. She's 10 now. She's on um, a 12-year-old girl's softball team as a 10-year-old. And not because she is trying to be an authoritarian or anything else. Guess who's the leader on the team? She is. How did that happen? I mean, it's not like somebody appointed her. She's the youngest member of the team. She got there because she's a really good pitcher. Uh, those who have played, uh, ladies, have y'all played uh, softball mm -hmm. uh, as an athlete? Amy, yeah. you have? Yep. I mean, it's, it's a very competitive game. It's, it's, uh, the, they start out when they're six or eight and it's lobbing it in there, but by the time they're 12 years old, they're throwing fastballs, and, and by the time they get to high school, it's really a competitive, it's a great game very uh, high skill level required. Well, here she is playing in a league with girls two years on average older than her, and yet she has emerged as the leader on the team, and I've just observed this. And the reason is that they have all found, not only do they respect her because she's a really good pitcher, uh, but they have found, and I've seen them come to her and say, Maddie, uh, I'm, you know, blah, 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 blah. And she listens. And she says, well, have you thought about blah, blah, blah? I mean, mature beyond her years. She's, she's got it, right? I mean, it sort of came natural to her. Well, that doesn't happen to everybody. Not everybody is a natural born leader. But it can be learned. And it can be uh, practiced. And by that I mean it can be a part of your life because after all you're all probably in leadership positions right now what, what do you do right now and I'm Emma? a resource manager at the Marco Camp. so you have people who work for you they work with me I'm not a you're not a supervisor, supervisor but, um, do you think you'll be a supervisor someday I think so yeah. how about uh, and, and thank you for role playing with me I'm not going to do this to the rest of you because we're going to move on in time here um, so uh, are you a member of a, a faith organization uh, as well? I am uh, not. I don't practice. How much. about uh, just an organization outside of work? Um, no, not, not really. What do you do for fun? Oh, gosh. Here, I go to the beach. Oh. Um, I go out with friends who are here. Okay. Vacation, All right, so you have a friend collective group? Oh, yes. Formal group yes. about family. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, four children, all grown adults. Yeah. Teenagers. I so bet. I, I bet I know who the leader in that family is. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to point out through this little role playing, because we have not met just just this morning, is that uh, leadership uh, is an opportunity that sometimes you're assigned, and sometimes it's just part of life. In fact, almost everybody in here is in part of an organization. And if you're not, 
the boss of somebody now or the chief influencer, um, you are probably uh, in a leadership role or will be at some point in your life. Uh, and by the way, if you're really good at it and you really like doing it, it flows to you in volumes and overwhelming waves at times. So I think you'll get a lot out of this. The last point I want to make is that there's also an introduction letter in there, and that gives you some of the details. If you've had a chance to read that, it talks about the POP. And by the way, um, we won't switch to it right now, but in, uh, you'll have a chance in the schedule Wednesday afternoon, we will spend some time in here where you will have an opportunity to uh, collaborate with me and with Sean and each other. And actually, uh, if you had not already begun preparing a PLP, you'll have some time in here in our schedule for you to, have, to do that. Because I know from experience that when you go outside the protective walls of our little enclave in here, that the whole world starts pulling at you, and it's very difficult to find the time uh, to sit down and think. In here, it's quiet. We have Kiali Rochelle music, which I love, but it's, it's, it's a place where you can seek the advice of trusted peers and others in the group, like Sean and I, to help you. Uh, so we're providing you the time in the schedule as part of our training. Uh, just before the uh, uh, reception that we've all been invited to for the uh, women and technology uh, panel is having a reception after their panel. Their panel ends the same time our day ends in here and you've all been invited and that's in your schedule as well. So as I said, uh, what we were going to do, time permitting this morning, was actually go through the schedule with you. The schedule that's in your student guide is the schedule. Whatever they had in the pamphlet, uh, which they printed out months ago, is wrong. So um, the schedule that's in your student guide is the schedule that we're going that we're following here. And the first session of that starts at 9:30, and we're exactly nine minutes late doing that. And so I want to introduce to you our Session one speaker, one of the uh, a, a very dear friend of mine, uh, in whom I have great admiration and respect, but an accomplished business leader who started her own business. It's a very successful, uh, very well known, um, and high performing uh, business uh, of her own. She has been the creator and leader of her own company, and it's really a pleasure as our session one guest speaker to introduce to you Miss Amy Padita. Amy, come on up. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, pleasure to have the opportunity to spend some time with each of you today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the principles of servant leadership and a leader's value framework. And uh, before I get started, I thought it would be helpful for me, if you don't mind, if um, I know who you are. And um, anyone here not in the service? Anyone from industry? OK. And where this is, do this you is. work? So I'm with Oracle. Oracle? Oracle? Great. OK. And everybody else is in the service? Am, am I OK with the? Mike, you're good? OK. So Nicolette? These are my notes, my pages. I keep these. And, uh, I don't think I've written this at all. Great. And Tyrone? Hi. 
And what do you do at Oracle? Yeah, so I've had this attorney job, 32 years in the industry, yeah. uh, working with federal and Department of Defense for the last 16 years. Um, and I work for the tech side for Paul Department. Great. Thank you. And Stephen? Hey. Hi. Uh, Scott Randall. Uh, I'm with the podcast right now. Have a little bit of some comments for him. It's just been fun in uh, Korea. Um, some tactical experience as well. Great. Well, thank you. Hello. My name is Emma Norbury. I work with Mr. Ellis over at the Information Environment Division at Mark Morpac. I'm the uh, IT Resource Manager. Basically handle all the uh, IT requirements. Great, thank you all very much. Um, so uh, Dave had shared a little bit about me with you in terms of having my own company, but I've actually worked in the um, government market. I've never served in the military, but I have supported the military and civilian agencies through industry. So I spent about 20 years in the telecommunications industry at AT&T and Lucent Technologies, and then was a chief operating officer in a small 8A firm, and then I started my company about 22 years ago. And over the course of that time, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of wonderful people, learn from people, um, and also gain a lot of experience in um, managing, leading, which, manage, as you all know, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, managing and leading are, are two different things. Uh, but I've learned, I think, the most from the people that I've had the opportunity to collaborate with over the years. And um, it's, it's part of what I value in leadership to know that you lead to take care of the people that you work with and that it's the, that the true assets <clears throat> that you have are the people in your organization. It's not your budget. It's not the product that you make or the product that you operate. It's the people. And so um, I wanted to spend time today uh, during our session to talk about uh, what servant leadership is what the principles and fundamentals of servant leadership are, and then what a leader's personal value framework is about and what it means to be a genuine leader. And then talk a little bit about what the characteristics are of leaders. And then um, I'd like to spend time asking you all about the kind of leaders that you are the kinds of leaders that you've experienced, um, good, bad, and ugly, and um, be able to have all of us think about what that really means to us and how we grow from that. So um, in, in addressing what servant leadership is, servant leadership has been around for thousands of years, but modern service, modern, excuse me, servant leadership uh, the movement was launched by um, Robert Greenleaf in 1970, published a, an essay called The Servant as a Leader. And um, in it, he addressed what the philosophy is uh, in serving the people that you work with. And it's all about, it's not about you as a leader, it's all about the people that you support, helping them find the greatest leadership within them, and helping everyone to reach their maximum potential. And so there are, it's, it's very different from what you learn uh, in traditional leadership where there's a pyramid and it's the leader who's at the top and all the people are underneath <coughs> that leader. And a lot of times um, in those situations, a leader thinks, that the organization is about everything to make her or him shine, when in fact uh, a true leader is someone that understands that it is 
uh, nurturing and supporting the people that are in your organization and helping them create the maximum potential for themselves and for the entire organization. So it's really <coughs> helping to um, get everyone to understand that what they contribute, excuse me, I'm sorry, <coughs> pardon me, that what they contribute is critical to the organization and that their needs come before yours do. And your job is to help build them, to help um, let them uh, determine what the right thing to do in the organization is and how to achieve results for the organization. Um, there, there are principles and fundamentals of servant leadership. And I, thank you. Thanks. Um, appreciate it. I will just let you all know that I often have to clear my throat, so I apologize for that up front. <coughs> um, but I had, I had been thinking about who are some of the leaders throughout history that I would like to quote when we're during our discussion. And there was a quote by John Quincy Adams that said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more and become more, then you're a leader. And I really like that because I do think that whether you're raising children, whether you're that third grader who ends up being uh, the leader or if it's on a sports team, it's your ability to have a vision, be able to articulate that vision and set the path and the direction that the organization will move in and um, your ability to inspire people. I think that that's a, a key element of leadership. And I would think that each of you have had that kind of inspiration in your life. And each of you have probably been very inspirational to someone else. So um, if, if you summarize servant leadership, it's emphasizing the ability to facilitate and help other people grow, and uh, also to uh, help achieve maximum potential, whether it's an individual or if it's the entire organization. But it is enabling people to become successful. And um, there are certain key principles of servant leadership that exist. You have to be able to listen. Listening to people is really important because you're not going to come to understand what does motivate someone if you're not listening. And you've got to be open to learning. All of us are learning all the time. And so I think listening is one of the most important um, attributes of a leader, um, being empathetic and trying to understand the perspective that someone else brings um, what their experiences have been that lead them to the ideas that they might bring up. We're all different. We all have different backgrounds. And so if you are empathetic, you're able to draw from people the, the best that they have to bring. Um, healing. So I think of healing as times when someone may be making their best effort and might fail, or they may have ways to have improved. And so to help them understand that their effort was, is appreciated at all times, but, and it's okay to fail or it's okay to fall short in some way, and help them feel good about what they learn or what you learn from um, a situation that may not have turned out the way you had wanted it to but you learn from it, and the next time you do better. And um, a good leader, I think, is, has to be very aware of their surroundings, very aware of the people that they are serving as customers, as citizens, um, and the people that they serve within the organization to understand what's happening at that time, to be able to make 
decisions and to be able to get the team to make decisions by understanding what it is that you know they are thinking and just being aware of the situation. Um, persuasion is a very important leadership trait, uh, but you have to be able to persuade people not by demanding that they think a certain way or demanding that they do something a certain way, but rather persuasion is by demonstrating possibilities and convincing people to think and come to conclusions that you might want to get them to, but at the same time, you yourself as a leader may be persuaded that, hey, they're right. This wasn't the best thing to do, and there's another way to do it. So persuasion and persuasiveness is important. Um, conceptualization, being able to create, create and um, come up with new ideas to have a situation at hand where you've got to achieve an outcome and where you can um, have a vision of what that outcome needs to be and what the path there is, uh, the path to that outcome is, and then be able to help people um, make that concept a reality. Um, obviously, foresight, taking time not just to think about what empirical data you may have, but to be able to really think ahead and, and think about um, what you want the outcome to be, how you want people to be able to thrive, and what you need to do to help them do it. And then stewardship. I think mentoring people and guiding them is probably um, a trait that not everyone in an organization that is supposed to be leading has really learned what that means. I mean, if it, it, we all have brothers, well, maybe not everybody, but brothers and sisters, and you have relatives. And so when you're the older child, sometimes even the younger children, you know, you'll, you'll take someone under your wing, and you will provide that kind of stewardship and, and guidance for them. And I think that that's probably one of the most important things about leading people is to recognize that each person has a different need and a different way that you can get behind them and support them to uh, achieve their goals. Um, again, being committed to people's growth and understanding that their goals and objectives may be different, but for each person in your organization, hello, um, for each person in your organization, you should be taking the time to figure out what are their goals, what do you need to do as a servant leader to help them achieve those goals. And then um, this is not just in the workplace or in the family, but just in general, all around us, building community. Um, a, a good servant leader understands the need for that and the value that comes out of that by um, being able to establish commonality and um, a sense of belonging that uh, the organization can live and work by. Um, before I, any questions or feedback, I mean, I'd like this to be interactive. So if there's anything that you all want to contribute at any point in time, um, please feel free. Anybody? Okay. Um, so uh, let's move on then to what it means to be a genuine leader. So values are what guide your are the guiding principles in your life. Everybody has a core set of values, and um, we should be living by them. Um, leadership is within the context of those core values. And um, you have to, it's very important to guide people through those values that you have. I mean, who you are at home should be who you are at work. You um, live by a code. And people need to see that. People need to trust that. And if they do see that you are genuine and that you 
you say what you do and you do what you say, and that you treat others with respect at all times. You may disagree. Everybody has differing views. And if you are able, though, in an organization, whether you're um, the leader at the top or the leader within the group, um, respecting people and treating people with dignity um, and makes everyone feel much better about themselves and everyone around them, and it lets them all come together to achieve their goals. So core leadership values, respect, integrity, being authentic. I mean, people know if you are true to your word. People know if you are real. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in an environment that's disingenuous. And I can't respect someone who is not um, authentic. And I don't want to follow someone. And I wouldn't expect anyone to want to follow me if I was not true to my core. Um, courage, I think, is a very, very important attribute of a leader. And you've got to not only be courageous to lead people through difficult times, but you've got to have the courage to um, stand by your convictions and uh, the courage to take on challenges that uh, people may bring your way. Um, you also have to have the courage, I think, to let your, the people in your organization make mistakes. And you've got to give them the ability to do the right thing by thinking instead of, well, here are the rules, and this is how we respond. Think of the times that you, um, I always think about when I call, anywhere you call, to get service, if it's making an airline reservation, whatever it is, how many times do you end up with someone that you're thinking, they're not listening, I'm their customer, why are they responding like this? So a leader needs to have the courage to trust their people and to allow their people to make decisions that are right for their customers. And, and maybe it's not what the guidebook says, but you know you should be able to trust your people, to trust their instincts as to how best to serve the customers that you have. Um, humility and um, the ability to not make things about you, but rather um, let your organization shine, let the people within your organization get credit for what they do, and to be humble and to serve them with that sense of humility, I believe, is, is very important. And I think that people respond much better to that. You know, they, you know when someone's great at what they do. You don't need to hear it from them. You know, and, and a leader is recognizing the greatness that their people bring to the table and trying to bring that out at all the time. And I know in my experience, the people that I have worked for and worked with that have demonstrated that kind of openness and trust, um, it, the results are incredible compared to something that is prescriptive. Um, and, and wisdom, I think that all of us possess uh, wisdom in varying degrees, and I think you gain it over time, and I think you gain the greatest wisdom from being open to the people that are in your organization who can teach you, right? I mean, that's, that's something very important in my mind to know that I am learning every day from people who bring new and different ideas and capabilities to the table. So um, what, are, what are the traits of a genuine leader? There are several that um, I have uh, put in here for you. Um, Self-awareness. question? Okay. Yes, yes, please.
Um, but is there is there value to having excellence as as a, as a core value, and maybe um, striving to be excellent? You know, not talking about that, striving to be excellent as a core value. I think so. I think that um, to have a passion for excellence, to always strive to to be the very best that you can be, and to always push yourself and your teammates um, beyond what you know would just be acceptable. I I believe in a commitment to excellence, and I I try to encourage people that I support to always um, push themselves for that excellence and to execute flawlessly. I mean, that's more of a tactical response to things, but I think that that has to do with a commitment to excellence. And so I agree with you that that excellence is um, part of your core value that you need in an organization. Right. Hey, pulling out of Syria is the right idea or the wrong idea when I'm not authentically, you know, behind that decision. You know, that it's really interesting because I was thinking about how a lot of servant leadership is about consensus. However, in a situation where You've got a life that you're going to save, you know, a hill that you've got to take. You don't always have time, right, for consensus. So that pyramid at the top where there is someone who's going to make a decision and say, look, this is what we've got to do right now. Yes, that's going to happen. So it's not always, this This is more, and, and I don't think you're not authentic, by the way, if you don't agree that, you should pull out of Syria. But the orders are, we are pulling out of Syria. I mean, your your job. So, it, so that just goes against, so right there kind of, it goes against the military style of leadership that we learn from a, from a very junior person in which what my boss says right. is now my idea. So like I had a really bad, sailors that you're leaving. And he said, I don't care. This is this is what we're doing. Okay, now as the person standing in front of the, the people that work for me, it's my idea. It's not the department head said, this is what we're doing. It's this is what I say we're doing because this is what, this is the direction we're going. Now, I own that idea. Even though it's a bad idea, and I'm, you know, I'm not a, you know, athletic to it, and I'm not, I don't like And you also may harm the overall mission sure. because there is obviously the uh, someone easily can detect that you know there's not uh, agreement and right. so and it's. There's, and there's, and there's so 
Can I, can I offer a comment as well? Yeah, I was going to ask you. I love the direction that uh, you're headed with this, uh, <clears throat> and I feel for you. Um, on a, the empty <laughs> seats you see here, we don't know where they are, by the way. <clears throat> um, Uh, so, yeah, well, that's a note. Uh, most of you in here have a military background. And so it was a natural turn to immediately say, <clears throat> what you'll find, though, in civilian organizations is that you have options. Uh, if you're in a business, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, you're being led down the wrong path by your leader, you have the option of objecting. And if you feel strongly enough about it, uh, removing yourself from that situation. Uh, Virginia, for example, is what we call a goodwill state. Now that's a really nice term for the, how you fire somebody. Uh, that's why in Virginia, it, the conversation can be as simple as, you know what, this, isn't, this just isn't gonna work out or it's not going the way we want. We're gonna head in a different direction, so tomorrow's your last day. Boom, you're fired. Uh, perfectly legal. Uh, it's called at will. Uh, I want to go back to uh, the, the example. Uh, I love it when somebody says, I had an awful boss. Yeah. I, when I was a captain, I was in uh, a senior 04 billet. It, it was actually should have been an 05, but it was a brand new signal brigade in Germany, and I was the captain who was told, you're the S3. And I knew that what the reason none of the majors wanted the job was because the brigade commander was a flaming a-hole, and everybody knew it. <laughs> so I was really being sent in as the sacrificial lamb, I guess, to uh, <clears throat> this guy actually <clears throat> in a meeting, sitting at the head of a table, just like the two of you are sitting there. So Becky, you get to be the brigade commander. All right, and so, is your coffee cup got anything in it? Okay, pick it up. And so the the S one. Uh, good, good. <laughs> Pretend. Okay, use your imagination here. So the S one is sitting right next to him. Stephen, you're the S one. That's the adjutant, the personnel officer. And the brigade commander asked him, and we're all sitting around the the U conference room table. Hey. Do I have the UCMJ authority to blah, 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 blah? And, and <laughs> so the adjutant gave his opinion. And he said, well, I, I'm not a lawyer, but my opinion is that you do not have that authority. The brigade commander exploded in a nuclear blast of fury, picked up his coffee cup, and slammed it down on the table, pretend, and we're all in shock, and then, because coffee splashed everywhere, and we're all in shock, and then the table actually went, <laughs> he broke the table in half with this magnificent karate chop using his coffee cup. I was shocked. And I promised myself, I'm never going to be that kind of leader. I don't care how tough it gets. I'm never going to be that kind of leader. I had experienced some great exceptional leaders. And one of those was my team sergeant. Uh, I'll just share this personal experience with you. Some of you, I'm sure, probably have uh, Heard what it sounds like when live rounds are coming at you as opposed to going away from you. It's a different sound. Uh, the first time you hear, uh, you know, those striking the leaves of the trees over your head uh, is, is quite a surprise uh, that, uh, to you. Well, I was the officer in a detachment that was under fire, and so the team daddy came up to me and said, <laughs> Lieutenant, what are your orders? I, I couldn't talk. My mouth was so dry that it was 
my head is filled with things. My training is all coming back. I'm completely focused. But I couldn't get anything out. My mouth was as dry. It's called cotton mouth. That ever happened to you? And my sergeant <coughs> reached down and picked a pebble up off the ground, stuck it in my cheek, and saliva immediately flowed. And he, he said, no, this is all the time. Things going on. And it was just this like moment, almost a scene from a movie. It was just pebble in my cheek and saliva flowed. And he said, Lieutenant, what are your orders? And I said, uh, uh, section A will engage with direct fire. B will maneuver uh, left. Well, I issued some orders. I forget exactly how. But we were trying to disengage. We knew we had a superior force in our face. And so we had to disengage. And that's how you're trained to do that, right? You face fire, maneuver. The next one gets in position, opens up fire. The enemy shifts. Then that allows you to disengage and move to me. So it's... Uh, uh, so, but I learned from that sergeant about stay calm. An exceptional leader is calm. It, have you ever worked for a leader who was a screamer? Yes. Who yelled? It's awful, isn't it? Please don't be that way. <laughs> Let me talk you out of it if I, if I can. The people around you are a Offended when you step on them with your voice. Right. Because you know what? I'll tell you something. In the, at the heart of it, I guarantee you that is not a principled person. Right. In fact, they probably have an inferiority complex and were they not in a position of authority would never be able to command any of your obedience to their orders or in the business world, do what you tell them. I think that we do a pretty good job, especially in the contemporary military of today, of weeding out most of those. But you know what? We still have toxic leaders. I don't know why we do, because they're totally ineffective. Now, I'm not saying for a second. There is a time for a boot in the butt. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. But if that's your style all the time, I guarantee you, your people's butts get, will, will get numb. And it will have an increasingly uh, a less effect than you would desire. How much better it is to be an exceptional leader who's principled, who's authentic, who has uh, all of those characteristics uh, woven into the very fabric of their beliefs and therefore their behaviors how much powerful is that organization going to perform? So I have an example from the Green Mountain Leadership Organization. Great. Um, so I've been in leadership for 20 years. So I, I ask why I'm not here. You know, I think there's always an opportunity to learn. Um, and so mentorship is also very important to me. Um, and I know the military is very different. My dad was in the Army. I know that. So I learned <coughs>
You know, you're so right. Thank you for that, uh, uh, personalizing us uh, a little bit. Uh, I'm sure there are other stories. How about, how about you? Do you tell me about the worst boss you ever had. The worst boss? I only had two good ones. Okay? Oh. Two good out of 40 years of work. That is a lot. But I want to say that these are... And people ask, people. why do we have this training? <laughs> Do you not think that you should be able to align your personal values and your core values with those of an organization? It's, it's very difficult to be who you are as a person and then have to be something that goes against all. You can't, I don't think you can truly lead that way. You can't, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. But you also can only control kind of who I would call it. So you, you, know, you can be a great leader from your chair with your followers. You may not be able to change the people above you, but you are a great middleman. Although I think you can, you know, I, I thought about the, have you all seen the movie The Last Castle Standing, I think was the name of the movie. Robert Redford. Oh, he's and, in prison? Uh, yeah, it the, was. The general who got thrown in prison? Thank yes, you very much. Yes, <laughs> That was a fabulous, it was a fabulous movie, and it was all yeah. about, it was totally about servant leadership. This was, did, did anybody see that movie? I think, Dave, you did, right? Yes. And so it's, it's well worth um, checking out because it is all about, the general who was, um, I guess he was court-martialed and, and uh, sent to prison, and it was a group of soldiers and military folks who were in prison for whatever reason, and um, Tony Soprano, except he wasn't Tony Soprano in this, but um, Jim Gandolfino played the warden, who was a mili also in the military, of course, and he was a horrible leader, he was a vicious leader, um, and Robert Redford who was truly a visionary leader and able to get all of these current prisoners to remember what their core values were as soldiers and uh, people in the military. And it, they took the castle. They took back the castle. And it was, it was terrific. And it was all about the fact that maybe this person has the authority because that's the rank. But if it's wrong... Um, I mean, you don't mutiny, but you find ways as a true leader to stand up for what is right. And I think that that's an important quality in a leader to let your folks live by that code and to, to listen to them when, when you are wrong, I and believe. So, yeah, I think you're right, Amy. And you know, one of the one of the challenges that all of you are going to have, I mean, uh, I'm getting to an age where, you know, I'm really focused on, well, frankly, my grandkids. I don't know, it's this phenomena that occurs when you suddenly have grandchildren. <laughs> but you're going to be leaders of a new generation of people who think that their feelings are facts, who think that their uh, opinions, based on their feelings, uh, should weigh as heavily or even more than uh, the facts may lead them. Uh, this is a very difficult environment to lead young people today right out of college who should have learned the disciplines of logical analysis and synthetic thinking and reaching a conclusion based on the facts. <laughs> In fact, uh, many of them uh, aren't interested in the facts because they're a lot more interested in their feelings about something and their, therefore their opinions are based on their feelings. And that is going to be a whole new challenge, I think, 
for uh, the workforce of the future, for our military in the future. Uh, and so, uh, God help you, uh, for those of you who are going to be taking on that challenge as leaders of them, or as <laughs> parents of them. Um, And you know, I think that's a great point. I think that every, every leader probably ought to take the opportunity when available to explain why certain things are being done a certain way or why you're uh, making certain decisions about certain things. You know, in a later session, we're really going to get into, and I think this was a point that uh, you were, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, Judy. Uh, uh, we're going to have a, ser a session about trust. And being in an organization where people trust each other and trust trust their leaders. So when you have those times when, you know what, I don't have time to explain why, <laughs> but we're going to do this, and if I get the situation later, I'll, I'll try to fill in the blanks for you. But um, it's always wise, I think, to work your boss's agenda. And... Um, but sometimes if your personal values cannot be reconciled against the direction that they're going, uh, then you have to make uh, maybe, if it's important enough, a, a, a bold right. decision. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, the good thing is, uh, Scott, uh, uh, not many people are probably going to ask uh, you whether we should pull out of Syria or not right. in the Air Force. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that was just an example. You know, I'm not sure the president's going to say, just a minute, let me, let me check with Scott Randall. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the background information. But you know what? Someday when you're, uh, how, may I ask you, how old are you now? Uh, 34. Someday you're going to be 54. And you're going to be a very senior person, either in the military or, or in a business. Because people who are in their 50s occupy 75% of the senior leadership positions in organizations in our country. People, when you get to be my age, you have your own company and you do what the heck you want. But you've worked your way through that. You know, I was running Mantec when I was uh, in my 50s. I was uh, a general in the Army when I was in my 50s. I was commanding Cybercom uh, in my 50s. And suddenly, I was retired and I was in business. But you know what? I was still in my 50s. And um, then suddenly, you're in your 60s. And that's when you start your own business. <laughs> because you just can't stand sometimes to not be your own boss. Uh, but anyway, I don't know I got off on a tangent there, Scott, but the fact is someday you are going to be 54 and you're going to be in a senior position of responsibility and you can think back to um, people may be calling you and saying, you know what, let's get Scott's opinion on this. He's got experience. He's got knowledge. He's got skill. We know he's calm. He's rational. He's a thinker. I'm sure he's thought this through. Let's let's. What greater compliment mm -hmm. than if the CEO of the company calls down and says, "Scott, what do you think?" Anyway. So, um, what I wanted to do that you have these materials, I'm sure. I wanted to close with the discussion, kind of the discussion that we're having now, um, to to ask you all. You know, who are the leaders that have influenced you and why? And who were the best leaders and the worst leaders that you've had? We've kind of um, addressed that a little bit. But um, if do you think we can close with just a few minutes of talking about things Sorry. like who has influenced you and why? Um, yeah. So
Yep, that is an absolute fact. I can tell you, my uh, brigade command sergeant major used to say that over and over again. I heard him say it to first sergeants and other sergeants major. He would say, if you take care of your soldiers, people, uh, they'll take care of the mission. When the, mi when the mission's not being performed to standard, it's probably not the soldiers' fault. It's their leaders. And he said, that's where you'll find, that's where, where I'll show up. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, that's great. That's a great example. You know, one of the papers I wrote that's in your uh, readings, I tell the story. In fact, it was uh, an Air Force uh, Brigadier General. Uh, says, you know, you can tell when an organization, you, you know when you're in an organization that has an exceptional leader. When you get up in the morning, you cannot wait to get to work. Mm -hmm. You really like being there. You love being with the people yeah, go ahead. I've heard you in several parking lots. If they back into the parking lot, they want to get off. If they pull in front, they pull in front later. <laughs> That's great, Judy. I, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. But unless it's a truck. Because all no, all of us guys who own trucks, we always back our trucks in. You know. We tactically park. <laughs> But that's a great example if they pull in and they're, they're there to stay. But we've all had those exceptional leaders in our lives. And uh, what we're doing here is, is trying to call that out uh, and make that a standard. You know, uh, we got pushed for time this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say we're going to move into the next hour, Amy, if that's okay. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. We have your shirt, Sean. We have a shirt for you. I'm not real impressed with our shirts this year, but, um, and um, another coin yeah, thank for you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. We just it want to say thank delight. you. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Amy Fadita, and Amy will stay with us for the second yeah. hour. Thank you again, Amy. You're, You're just terrific. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so here's what we're going to do uh, next. We're going to build on what we were just doing, but we're going to give you a chance to write something down uh, of all the information that Amy did. And by the way, great job, Amy. That, Thank you. Sometimes you just got to put it on the slide so you can read it, because these are the things that uh, went, the, the first session, believe it or not, is the hardest, because she lays the foundation for everything that's going to happen here in the next five sessions. I want you to think now on your own experience, and I want you to think about good and bad, and what the characteristics of the exceptionally good leader are. And so the exercise is going to be slightly modified for what was in your binder. Instead of coming up with uh, three, I just want you to say an exceptional leader believes, and I gave you an example. Do any of you have that exercise up in your computers or in printouts or anything? Mm -hmm. It's in your binders. Good. So if you look at session one, the tab one, and you look at the exercise, first of all, 
if you look at uh, when you when you have a chance, uh, I can't uh, turn that. Session one, go to session one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And okay. Uh, I guess uh, we, it's in. It's probably in the guide that's in the website or something. But anyway. Is that where the readings are, Sean? The, the readings are on the, on the bulletin. Oh, okay. Well, so I can't. No matter how much you flip through your bulletin, you won't find them. You'll have to find them on the website. But in that, I talk about uh, uh, General Mike, Michael, who was the Air Force guy who talked about, who made the statement. Uh, you know when you're in a great organization that's got an exceptional leader. You can't wait to get to work. You can't wait. You feel valued. Uh, people get along. Um, people work harder than the example you were given. You were an exceptional leader. You had an exceptional leader. Why aren't they all like that? Right? Well, because they haven't, they haven't maybe it's because they didn't come here to this little three-day class. And understand, that's what people want. Not only want, deserve. Leaders who really understand what it is to be exceptional and the results that will come from that because your people believe. Well, it starts off by having principles that are become part of the belief. If you believe this is true, then you're going to behave in a certain way. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to break into three groups real quick. Uh, one, two, and three. One, two, three, and one, two. So you have two person group. You've got some butcher paper on the wall. What I want you to do is to draw up on one right on the top an exceptional leader and then write believes and on the other side write behaves. And I gave you, uh, you can't, if you see the example I gave you, it was like a three-column thing. You've got believe, and then the other two really are behave part. If it believes that integrity matters, and they behave because they tell the truth, sometimes even when it hurts. But, they, but they've learned, they've got the skill set to deliver tough truth in a positive way. Um, so break up into your small groups. Uh, you've got your butcher paper. You've got some Mark markers in the, in the black containers. And uh, prepare those things. And here's the thing. Uh, you only have um, about 10 minutes to do this. Because then each group's going to do some feedback with the other group. We go, okay? Everybody understand? All right. Great time for uh, bathroom break and refreshments at the same time. I've never heard that before. If you pull in, you're there to stay. If you're back in. Sessions, uh, George, uh, uh, are fluid. You know, we have uh, a world. It's really all about the outcome that we're seeking. There's uh, an appreciation and an understanding of. Uh, I mean, I'm jumping in. I mean, uh, you know, 
We only have a third of the people. So we have 21 seconds. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody I, I can knows after. that particular yeah. admin. He is going to offer I've audience. had a whole range of excuses. Of I know that the elevator I was in actually uh, had water in it. And uh, when I stepped into the lobby of the diamond place, I couldn't well, step in the water. It rained so hard, the water from the garden area actually was running in. And uh, they were squeegeeing it out. Yeah. So I don't know whether that had anything to do with the parking. I think that, uh, oh, there's Jamie. There's Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah, great. George Gallarisi, Amy Fadidi, Amy Fadida. Amy just said we're in uh, the exercise portion of session one right now. No? Yeah, of course. You know the way here now. That's what I heard. In fact, uh, Judy, one of our students, said she thinks a lot of the students that were on the way here got trapped in the exhibit hall. I haven't been out there yet. I mean, this morning, when I came over here really early, it was not an issue. But uh, really, how come? Some coffee. <laughs> no, I just that's just me. You were doing great. I'll see you at one. Great. Hey, Jamie, what, uh, you brought your wife? Yeah, she's in the Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. Thank you so much. Yeah, she's getting a little cup of hot tea. Sorry. Oh, good. Good. I was going to invite her to come to your session. Hi. Hi. So you're Jamie's Hi, Janet. better. Yeah. Hi, Janet. <laughs> nice, to nice to meet you. Yes. That's great. This is so exciting. Well, I, it's so great to have you here, too. You know, if you want, you can come sit in on his session if you oh, want. No, I don't know. I don't want to make you <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's very good. I'm sorry for that. I'll think about it for sure. Yeah, we're actually in the practical exercise part of the first session. Oh, okay. So okay. The, you know, actually, session one is the hardest one to do because it kind of gets everybody going. And we have this huge mystery right now. One third of our students are here. Two thirds are missing. I, I don't know. Uh, Judy has a theory. It's about why, where all the uh, people are who's supposed to be. She thinks yeah, they got the captured floor. on the floor. I think we will, we will have people come into the Kalia Tower and take the elevator to the second floor and put them right here instead of going up and coming yeah, through the exhibit hall. So what, what, what hotel part of the hotel are you staying in? Oh, okay. I, I stay in uh, the lowest cost power here, too, uh, because they, they pay for that for me. So I always make sure I'm a good steward of the, of the chapter. But, uh, but this morning, um, I noticed that in my elevator, it was sort of spongy. I'm coming down from the 12th floor, and the elevator door opened in the lobby, and I, I stepped out into water. The water, the diamond head, is on the same level. It flash flooded, and the whole 
was. And we had alarms go up, and the thunder and lightning alone. At first, I remember the lightning, and I thought, "Who is up at this hour taking pictures off of their balcony?" And then, boom! I thought, "Oh my God, this is like being back home in Alabama on the sun- August afternoon." <laughs> <laughs> well, so you'll be back at one, and you're certainly welcome to join us if you want to come in here and you go home and tell the kids, "Hey, I saw your dad, and actually he's pretty good. He's actually pretty good." <laughs> Okay, it's a pleasure. I'll see you at one, baby.
gosh, you guys did great. Chris? Okay, how are we doing here? We're ready for uh, the second sheet. Would you like that? Careful what you ask for. <laughs> no, we're, we're good. We've got a little bit of space left. So why don't, we, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started and some feedback and some discussion. I want to ask you, uh, <clears throat> is any, anyone having trouble or any issues uh, getting to the website, the, I mean the shared drive, the Google shared drive, where so much information is located? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you you got your access. Did you get in okay? Okay, good. Good. Yeah. So, did, yeah, we didn't. You didn't get the email. So Sean will have to get all that to you. Sean, Judy didn't get any of the previous, the earlier emails because she didn't know she was coming until today. Good. So that's where you find all these wonderful papers I wrote and all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, so here's, <clears throat> we're going to spend about, uh, I've got 10 of 11 here. We're going to spend uh, some time in our and some feedback here in open discussion. And then we'll have a, uh, a chance for you to, if you will, have have an opportunity with your own outlines to synthesize what you've learned, heard, uh, remembered, shared, whatever, here that you may want to note um, on a personal basis. Uh, these are the three things that uh, I believe about leadership that I believe are the three most, these are the three most important things I believe about leadership. Um, that's when you by personalizing what we've done here in session one, and if you think about it, uh, Amy gave you an, uh, a wealth of information about uh, characteristics and principles and all of those things. The hard part is when you're sitting down to think about, gosh, this is what I think are the three things I believe most strongly about leadership that are part of my own personal belief pattern that I intend to exhibit in my behaviors to my people, and I'm going to write those down and give them to them, and they're going to expect you, in fact, to behave consistent with what you say you believe in. You know, if you behave in ways that are inconsistent with what you say, uh, what is what are you? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Disingenuous not authentic, uh, and you know what? Have you ever had a leader that was like that? <laughs> oh, no, that, that never happened. Um, oh, you're so important to me. Oh, by the way, you're fired. <laughs> what? I even had uh, heard a story one time uh, uh, somebody told me um, this. She said, I lost my job and my boss, she told me that I was so good that I didn't belong there anymore. <laughs> she said, what? What a crock of you know what. <laughs> That's not being very genuine, very honest, whatever. Okay, let's go. Did I say this was group one or did I say this was group one? Okay, why don't we start over here. Who's, who's our emergent leader to brief? Uh, the results here. That's all you. All you. Now, by the way, uh, what I didn't tell you, but I'll share with the other two groups here, is that, uh, Tarome, uh you are automatically not eligible to be the briefer in the follow-on exercises. So by being chosen by your team as the emergent leader to be the first briefer, in other words, everybody's going to get their chance to talk. Go ahead.
I do. The second one we have, lead from the front, or uh, lead, lead by example. I was always taught what you probably don't use. Was, uh, when I was still in the military, was when I got to a leadership position, was I was always the first one and the last one out. I always made sure that all my guys were always first one to fly. Right. Uh, empower with others. Allow your team to make mistakes. Great. Thank you. Any comments, uh, questions? Let me uh, ask some questions, follow on here to team one. And growth is important, and you say provide training. I would also like to submit that committing yourself to being a lifelong learner, um, always open to new ideas, better, better ways to improve as a leader, be open to inputs and experiences and the value added by everybody. You know, that's the true test of andragogy in a group like this is. Every one of you's opin opinion based on your experiences, based on your knowledge and skills is as valuable as everyone else in here. This whole, everyone in this room right now is viewed as a valued participant uh, in the overall learning because uh, part of your responsibility as a leader is not only continue to train, uh, mentor, raise up your replacement, if you will, and we're going to get into that in the people session, a little more detail, what that means, but also your own self as a lifelong learner. Um, when I went to graduate school at North Carolina State, uh, I was planning on I had been in the Army about uh, three years. I had a four-year commitment, so I thought I was, I only had a year to go. And so I decided uh, that I wanted to use uh, this wonderful thing that we had, not only my GI Bill, but also tuition assistance, but active duty, so I could uh, basically go to graduate school on my own, study what I wanted to study. It turned out to be a lot harder than I thought. Um, <clears throat> because I was in Special Forces at the time and we were on constant deployments. Uh, it was hard to keep up. In fact, at my oral final uh, up on the campus, this is another one of those like scenes from a movie. Uh, I'm sitting outside the, the, the room and the door goes, you know, double doors. And I'm sitting there. <laughs> come inside. <laughs> I walked inside and there was a big room, a table, seven people sitting at the table, all looking very professorial, and a chair. And in those days we had chalkboards. I, I know, Scott. These were things that we had that, oh. <laughs> Scott looks so young to me. He look, I tell you who looks young. We, we had Dave Page back there. Yeah, he's actually not a high school ROTC cadet. He's actually a captain in the Air Force also. He just looks so young. But um, so we may have to, Dave, uh, chalkboards were things you had chalk and you actually, uh, you probably never saw one before, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyway, that's all there was in the room. Chalkboard, a chair, this table with all these distinguished looking people. And my advisor, my committee advisor, though, started out by introducing me as Captain Dave Bryan uh, from Fort Bragg. He's uh, been very faithful over the, it, it only took, for, for our two-year program, it only took him five years to complete. Because it turns out I did not leave the Army. Um, you know, sometimes uh, angels touch you and you don't realize it. I actually was on a deployment and I missed the suspense date on the item, uh, do you plan to leave the service or not? You know, it's like one of those notes in kindergarten, uh, I like you, do you like me? Check yes or no. Well, I wasn't there to say, no, I'm not going to stay or yes, I'm going to stay. 
I just missed it, so they assumed he's staying. So <laughs> when, when, I, when I got back, uh, it, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I finally, oh, I think I was supposed to get out. Uh, and I went down to the personnel center and said, oh, no, you, by default, you optioned in for four more years. <laughs> Turns out pretty good. Turned out good for me. I don't know what I would have been doing. I guess teaching, teaching somewhere in high school. But anyway, so he says, before we begin uh, asking questions, I just went and he pulls up this box and he pulls it out on the table and had all these envelopes and had stamps from all over the Africa and South and Central America because I never missed a paper, even though sometimes it was written on that yellow line stuff that we use in the military. Who invented that stuff, by the way? You can't. Yeah, I mean, I have. I, I even go to uh, Staples and I actually go in there and buy it now because I'm so used to using it, even though... It's really hard to see if you write in pencil on it. You know? So anyway, some papers I had written in pencil, you know, by flashlight or whatever, and somehow got them mail handed to some Air Force resupply plane that got them in the mail from I don't know, but he pulled them out and he said he was really determined. Um, some of his papers were actually worth reading, but but we always found it fascinating that we had this collection of envelopes and stamps from all over the world because he, he never missed a suspense. Now, what was the point I was getting at here? Uh, oh, so because my I was doing this graduate work, it was in adult learning. I was really interested in, even back in, this is in the mid-70s, I was already thinking about can't we automate and make higher education available for working adults? Because this was really hard for me. I was driving back and forth to the campus at North Carolina State in Raleigh from Fort Bragg two nights a week when I was at Bragg, when I was there. Uh, you know, I would leave work at 5.30 to be in class by 6.30 in Raleigh, and I was in class until... 9.30, and I would drive back. Uh, who would do that? Well, I did, because I had a goal, and I really wanted to get this degree. I really wanted to learn about adult learning, and I wanted to challenge some assumptions that, that have today become so commonly accepted, but were not so commonly acceptable then. There was no such thing as online in the mid-'70s. There was no Internet yet. Uh, and I did not know, have any uh, real vision about what I thought the Internet was going to be, but I did know that you, we were going to be able to dial up and do things electronically at least, uh, and uh, that would make higher education. Because you see, up until that point, you had to leave your job and go to a campus in order to go to graduate school to, get, to work on your, your doctorate degree. And there was no other acceptable alternative. And the schools that still require that are way behind the times. They're cutting themselves off from so many of us who, who love working for and, and want to continue to be uh, lifelong learners as good leaders should be. Uh, anyway, that's the point, that being a lifelong learner. And so I really appreciate the fact that the first thing, the first thing that Group 1 thought of is they believe that leaders who are truly exceptional believed in growth, not only for their subordinates, but, and I'm adding to their, with, with your permission, this concept of also lifelong learning on their behalf so that they're always learning to be a better and better leader. Any, any comments y'all want to add to? Uh, oh, that, really? So, Nicolette, that was your idea first. Own it. Own it. Come on. All right, uh, and, the, and the last point, whose, whose idea was that? Find the positive. I think that is really powerful. Judy, was that you? Yes. I thought you were in group two. No, well, I don't know how you count. I thought it was one, two, three, and I wanted to get together on two, but get together on three. So. Well, you just seized the initiative and just moved out. Good for you. <laughs>
So what what did you mean by that? Well, even find the positive. Find the bad employee, you gotta find the good. Because if you keep harping on the bad, then you're taking on If you want to change the employee, try to pull out the positive. You know, Amy and I both are um, consultants. Uh, I think she's a great consultant. And, you know, people who pay us for our services don't do that because everything's great. They usually bring us in to solve problems, fix things. And sometimes it's really difficult to find the positive. Exactly. Thank you. Amy, how about an example where you have been brought in and it's always a problem, right? Uh, can you help us? fix this, they know they got a problem, they don't know how to define it, but how do you turn it in and find the positive in it? You know, one of the common things that, that I run into, Amy and I uh, have lunch together from time to time and compare notes about, uh, I tell her all my secrets, she tells me uh, none of hers. But, uh, but we have small businesses that are couple owned and they've gotten to a point where they are a certain amount of revenue. And for some reason, it's, it's somewhere in this range of 17 and a half to about 25, and they're millions of dollars of revenue a year, and they're stuck. Now, they've got a vision of themselves that we help them realize about bigger. But then, as we'll learn later on in vision, vision is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. There has to be a plan <laughs> to get you from where you are to that. And where I have trouble sometimes finding the positive is when I realize this happens more often than you might think. When I realize that the people that they have working for them that got them to where they are aren't the people for the next step. What do you do? I use the phrase repurpose. I mean, you don't want to just get rid of them, but they're not going to be able to, staying in the leadership roles they're in, they're not going to be able to go much further in the company. So you find a way, just find a way. You just have to be creative. And sometimes it's just, it's as uh, hard as them throwing their hands up and going, I don't know what to do. And sometimes, though, when you simply ask the owners of the companies, if you were in their shoes, how would you want to be treated, what do you want them to do? Because they really like these people. They trust them. I mean, there's nothing downside except that they don't have the experience and the skill to move the revenue bar. Uh, well, you don't come, yeah, so you don't come to that conclusion without some, all of that already having taken place. You, you determine through due diligence and and all of that. Uh, this CFO uh, needs to be uh, maybe our compliance officer and do something different in the new organization because they're not good enough. You know, we got to get beyond our, our QuickBooks and get to something more sophisticated. So anyway, 
you can always find the positive, and that's the point I wanted to reinforce. Uh, that, and I can tell you that Amy and I run into that working with small businesses in particular all the time, helping them find the positive, find the way ahead that, that results in positive. Okay, group two. Oh, was this two? All right. All right. How did I do that? One, three, two. I, you know, it's, uh, will wonders never cease? Okay. Oh, I see. So I numbered you off. And then I said, all the ones here and all the two. Ah. Of course I meant that. That's the way I, that's the, that's the way I meant it. <laughs> yeah, you said, I want to be part of that team. All right. A lot of the same themes. Um, so um, maybe a couple I'll highlight. Uh, one, uh, a leader believes in transparency. Um, and like, what does that mean? So, uh, well, what does that mean? We'll get into how that, what that looks like, right? So that, that behavior that shows transparency is um, you communicate. You communicate often. Um, you're sharing ideas. Mm -hmm. Trust is important. And, and trust, uh, it's, it's good character or character and competency, right? So you have character and competency that, that kind of goes to trust. And how does that look like, that character and competency? Um, well, competency, we kind of talked about it here. Uh, being knowledgeable, right? You know what you're talking about. You, you have that self-learning um, going on for you. Anybody ever worked for a micromanager? Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, Do you think that they trust you? Why are they micromanaging you? Because they don't want to be, and they always will. They have a hard time letting go. Maybe sometimes they just want to be down in there. You know, one of the things Not about, right yeah, you know, I think you're all right. But here's the thing I've learned about people. You may hear me say this more than once in these three days. People insist on being human. <laughs> eh, it'll come. It'll come to you. But, and by that I mean, though, they're complicated. And so their, their motivation for why someone is a micromanager um, may be because they just don't know how to trust. And without becoming a psychiatrist and digging into their background, why are they not trusting? But it may also be that they just are fearful uh, well, maybe that's trust. Their uh, loss of control because they're fearful. Uh, yeah, maybe it does just come down to trust. That's an interesting thing. Uh, we've, a lot of you have probably been through the points you just made about introvert, extrovert. I've been through the Myers-Briggs thing. And uh, by the way, uh, neither is more or less than the other. It's just where do you draw your energy, right? That's the difference. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I draw my energy from being in here with all of you. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, just dry. Just I'm just, just going to be bone dry by Thursday afternoon. I'm going to. But I know a lot of people. Uh, one of my best friends, uh, she is um, really. Uh, she loves being with her grandchildren, but they exhaust her. As opposed to her drawing energy from them, they exhaust her, and she really likes some time with her books. In you know, in bed with the lights dim and just a single spot. I mean, like that little spot of light is. Excuse me. That's how she recharges. That's how she recharges. Exactly, and so people are different, complicated. Yeah, cover cover one more point, and then we'll sure. go to the next group real quick.
One, one of the military types in here, I'm gonna role play with you later on, and it'll be a surprise to you when it happens, but I'm so confident that I know how you're going to react that you'll see what, and it has to do with this issue of standing up, the courage issue, the, that critical principle and component of exceptional leaders. You know your boss has your back. And your boss knows you have their back. I mean, there are lots of people I have served with in the military that I would not want to share a foxhole with because I believe that they would think their best chance of survival is shoot me and take my ammo as opposed to being in a foxhole with someone I can tell this about you, Scott. You and I would sit in there and we'd just hammer away at the enemy until we're both dead or we'd kill all of them and then celebrate with a hand slap. I know I can trust you. I can already see that in you, that you would, you would have my back. You'd be aiming this way, and I'd be aiming this way. And we'd fight it till the end, without a shred of doubt <clears throat> that we would be there for each other. That's band of brothers stuff, right? <clears throat> that kind of trust. Gosh, if I could bring that to every business and every, if I could just, I can't even get that in my church vestry. I, we have some of the most incredible competitions going on in the 12 people that our congregation elected to be our church best. I'm, I'm Episcopalian, by the way. Any other Episcopalians? Well, good. Then I'll tell jokes about Episcopalians later. Uh, no one will be offended but myself. But uh, we do like to think of ourselves as the frozen chosen or otherwise known as Catholic light. Um, Anyway, I don't want to go there. I want this chan uh, team. Tell me your number one, most important, five-star belief that results in exceptional behavior. Um, I think that they were discussed were believing in themselves, not that they don't have humility, but if they don't have confidence. So right. Um, so confident in both their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, if you already know what you're weak on, then you're not going to get offended if someone points out what you're weak at because you already you already know it. So if they have a way to help you kind of bridge the gap on that weakness, that's what the rest of the team is there for is to fill in your weaknesses. So um, I think that's. But at the same time, we want to be confident, but still open to other people's perspective. So I think that was. I, I think that's huge, and I, I could not agree more. I have often observed toxic leaders. The failure of toxic leaders has everything to do with self-confidence and self-esteem, and the reason they beat up on people around them is because they have such little faith in themselves. And by the way, <clears throat> confidence doesn't necessarily mean swagger. I commanded, the battalion that I commanded in the Army was the uh, Special Operations Signal Battalion at Fort Bragg, the 112th. Uh, I was the first command. You know the unit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're, you were in SOF in Korea and, and PACOM? Yep. Yeah, so the, the yep, the detachment yeah, providing you awesome. comms? Yeah, awesome. So we started, by the way, our, uh, from I was just there in September on the 33rd birthday of the battalion since I activated it as the first commander. I'm very proud of the fact that I was the one who went to the Army and said, we got to have this new unit. And I actually convinced the Army as a major, you know, he's right, let's do this. So they put me in command. It was your idea, now you go command it. From day one, uh, I told everybody, we have to have practice excellence in everything we do. Everything. From maintenance in the motor pool to admin in the, in the personnel center to Athletics, we don't go out to play softball because we love softball. We're going to go out and play softball because we want to be the champions. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to play as hard as we can. And to this day, if you go there as a unit, if you stop and just 
ask them, well, you saw them perform. And these, by the way, are young people. And they're absolute experts. They didn't arrive that way, but they became experts because they, this sense of excellence in everything they do permeates <clears throat> the whole unit and down to the detachments which deploy to provide con support for overseas uh, Jesotas. So you were Jesota of Korea? Yeah, Sok, uh, Sok Korea? Yeah, just Sok Korea. Yeah, okay. And they have Sok Pak and they have Sok Temp. Every theater has its own special operations command. And every JTF. And every JTF. And so those detachments from this battalion provide support to them. But when I was uh, uh, visiting them, <clears throat> they look great. I mean, I even told them this. I, I meant it sort of as a half truth. They took it, they all laughed when I said it, but I said, you know what? I'm, I want to commend the battalion commander and the battalion command sergeant major for upholding the first and most important standard for the members of this battalion. And they're all standing in formation listening to me. I said, you have to be good looking to be in this unit. And you're all really good looking. Oh, they all laughed at me, but I actually kind of meant it. Because you know what they had? It wasn't a bravado that was obnoxious, but they had that confident swagger. And their step comes with self-confidence and being confident in not only your abilities, but the people that you're with, and knowing that they've got your back and you've got their back. Uh, you can't pay enough money to have this sense of oneness that comes with people who believe in each other uh, and are competent in their own abilities uh, to the point where they, they are so effective as leaders, it's unbelievable. Okay, so we're concluding session one here. I hope that you've drawn from this session some clues of things that you would say in your personal leadership philosophy. These are the three things I, that are most important to me about what we talked about in session one. These, I believe this. I believe integrity matters. I believe that uh, you, my people can count on me to tell the truth to them even when it, it may be painful, and I expect the same from them. I believe that um, uh, people need to be competent, and, and it's my responsibility to make sure that I give them the opportunity to express their competence in ways that... Develop. I mean, this is how you want to be writing these things into making it very personal, personal part of your... Uh, personal leadership philosophy, okay? Now, the next one, uh, we'll be reconvening here at 1300 for the military folks. Uh, well, one, that's 1 p.m. for the Air Force guys. Um, yeah, I know. I, okay. All right. I take it back. I take it back. I uh, hereby apologize, sort of. And uh, no, so we'll be back here at 1 p.m. Uh, Jamie Holcomb will be our speaker. Uh, Jamie is the CIO for the yes. Oh, uh, did whoop, well. Hold on. Maybe I stand corrected. What time? Lunch is at one. Oh. Oh, okay. And where is lunch? No, fourteen hundred is is perfect. I think I told Jamie something wrong. Maybe you could text him. Yeah, 1,400 schedule. Okay, my bad. Good catch. Before everyone heads out, do you have anything else for them? That's it. Okay, before everyone heads out, um, one, do you know what a type of ballroom is? Because I know we're going to cross the street, so do you, can you go with them over? Okay, I need to...
Yeah, we thought that we were going to be 24 here. That's the third. Yeah, make sure you take your ticket for Tuesday lunch. And don't take that at the door as you go in. Two tickets for Tuesday lunch? 